Hi guys, Lee here from Overbyte Gaming, and this week we're doing something a little bit different. Um, I want to take some time to talk about, well, some computers I've had in the past. Uh, ones I've spoken briefly about before in my history of gaming, which uh, you can find on our channel, plug plug. And today we are talking about the mighty ZX Spectrum. Now this thing has a very special place in my heart. Uh, it was pretty much the first computer I got. It was after I had the Atari 2600, yes, but um, it was so good at the time. Just getting the games on tape for like three quid from a news agent, it was amazing. Uh, so we're going to go through it. We're going to go through the hardware first, and then we're going to go through a few examples of the games. I apologize for not showing my lovely face. Uh, you'll have to suffer this week, though. No, oh, that's a shame. The first model of Spectrum that came out was the infamous rubber keyboard one. Um, it was available in 16 and 48K formats, and it did the job. You had a tape deck that you plugged in. The key I never had this one myself. The keyboard was horrible, but it was a small price to play because you've got games that are cheap and you can play, and this is the start of the British IT industry. So Clive Sinclair released this sucker and basically kick-started, or at least a lot of people think he did, the British IT scene. And that's just amazing and noteworthy in and of itself. They followed that up with the Zectrum Plus, which is the one I had. It had 48k of RAM, it was a little bit bigger, had a proper keyboard, well, kind of a proper keyboard, it was um, an injection molded one. It wasn't as good as keyboards nowadays, but it did the job, and it had all of the good things that you had with the previous one. Uh, again, you loaded stuff off tapes, which was good and bad, because they were cheap, but also you could spend like five minutes waiting for a game to load, or longer, and then it just crashed, and you'd have to do it over again, which yeah, it was a bit irritating to be honest, but there was still a lot of good stuff out for it. They then upgraded to the Spectrum 128. 128k of RAM, my goodness. Now we're getting with the big boys. Uh, it looked very similar, just with uh, an external heatsink on it. But uh, you did get games that were 128k only. So it took advantage of that extra memory and was able to shift a lot more stuff around and have a lot more on screen at the same time. Now, there's a bit of a, a watershed moment here, because uh, Clive Sinclair, uh, the guy that, whose brainchild was the Spectrum, uh, was never very interested in gaming. He always saw the Spectrum as something uh, for business, and he wasn't very interested in the gaming market, which was where it was really doing well. So what happened was he decided he would do other things, such as portable televisions and the infamous C5 electric trike, which bombed horribly. Uh, as a result of this, Alan Sugar, yes, he of apprentice fame in this country, uh, swooped in and uh, bought Spectrum with his Amstrad company. Amstrad had been producing uh, computers as a competitor to Spectrum, and now they got to have the Spectrum label as well. And we saw a lot of crossover between the Amstrad products and the Spectrums as they went on. The first machine released by Amstrad under the Spectrum brand was the Spectrum Plus 2. Um, this basically looked like an Amstrad CPC 464. Uh, it had a data recorder inset into it, uh, which led to a few problems, because sometimes when you're loading a tape, you need to fiddle with the volume control. With this inbuilt one, you couldn't do that. I had a friend who couldn't get certain games to run. I've had friends that could get certain games to run, so it's up in the air whether or not that actually made a difference. But I know to some people, it did. It looked a lot, it looked a lot more like the CPC as well. It was a bit boxier and had a better keyboard, definitely. The keyboards were spring-loaded and they felt much nicer to type with. And moving on to the ZX Plus 3. Uh, I actually had this, it introduced the three inch diskette, uh, which allowed games to load a lot faster. This was also taken from Amstrad's CPC line. Um, it was very good, it ran a few less games, it was less compatible going forward, but you, if you got a game on disc after spending most of your years loading from tapes, it was just night and day. It was amazing. I have discs like probably still knocking around somewhere with just the this, the finger marks at the front on the label of the disc have just worn the disc down. It's, that's how much we used it. It was great. 
So that was pretty much it for a Spectrum. They sort of finished with the Plus 3. There were a few models released, which were sort of mixed and matches between the models, like the Plus 2 and the Plus 2B and the Plus 3B. But none of them really did anything too significant, and none of it really encouraged Amstrad to put out another one. So with that said, that's a brief history of the rundown of the technology of the Spectrum. Let's look at some games. Ah. The first game I want to talk about is a game called Rebel Star. It was a turn-based strategy game. Uh, basically, you had the raiders that were trying to infiltrate a space station and destroy it, or a lunar station, perhaps. It was definitely a, not in space, but it was on a planetoid of some sort. And then you had the operatives, who were the guys inside who had to repel the raiders. Very simple, but great, because it did some really interesting stuff for the time. Uh, you could pick up weapons, and the weapon that they had equipped actually changed the way the character looked. This is like... There are RPGs today that don't do that, which annoy the hell out of me, but... You know. So, at that time, it was just amazing to see that, and a real thrill. I mean, I spent hours on that. It was just so much fun, and there are a few cheeky winks to Star Wars in there as well. <laughs> okay, guys, real talk now. My dad would absolutely freaking kill me if I don't mention Night Gunner. It was not one I really got on with, but uh, he loved it. I was kicked off that computer so many times so he could play it. So what it is, is you're flying a bomber in World War II, and you're in, you've got a turret thing, and you shoot airplanes and blimps that go across, and you just move the targeting reticle around and shoot things. And then you have bombing sections where you're going above with a targeting reticle, and you just drop bombs on things. I didn't, re didn't really get it. I mean, it was okay. There was nothing wrong with it. But uh, Dad freaking loved it. It was, it, it was his crack. <laughs> My dad doesn't do crack, I'm just putting that out. One of the most successful games, it, it, was, it was bundled in packs and everything ever made, was Batman the Movie, and Ocean did a stellar job with it. And the ZX Spectrum version was no slouch. I enjoyed the hell out of that game. Uh, the platforming, um, taking down the bad guys with the Batarangs, Okay, the, the uh, Batwing and uh, Batmobile sections, not quite as good, although they did a good job integrating a lot from the movie into the game. I mean, even like to turn your Batmobile, you had to latch onto a lamppost and swing around like they did in the movies. It was really well done and was in the publisher Ocean's heyday when they were putting out some really good stuff, which includes Robocop, which I have previously Let's Played. And that is an amazing game, that one set all kinds of records at the time and probably still holds them oh no the sims came out didn't it oh. another game i feel i would be totally remiss if i didn't talk about was cobra uh it i believe it was coded by joffrey hughes the guy that did um a green beret or russian attack as it's also known in other climbs i mean this game pushed the spectrum to its limit it had big beefy sprites and lots of animation going on it was just a simple sort of point A to point B, run forward, shoot people. It was it was good fun. It was pretty hard, though. I mean, a lot of these Spectrum games I've gone back and tried to play in my, you know, Call of Duty softened brain. And wow, games were so much harder back then. <laughs> yes, I know I play games on easy. Shut up. Okay, and that brings us to the end of this little retrospective of the Spectrum. Ret retro Spectrum. I should have called it that. Shit. <laughs> But yes, I have really enjoyed talking about it because the Spectrum was one of my childhood staples. It, it was just, I didn't know we were getting it. The parents brought it home and it was just amazing. I mean, it, it looked primitive because of the way it used colors. And you basically you portion colors to parts of the screen and then sprites just moved in front of them. So a lot of the time, your sprites would be changing colors as it went across. But, I mean, so, so compared to the stuff that the C64 was doing at the time, you know, the graphics were a little bit primitive. But just for fun, man, it had so much good stuff. Uh, you had different joysticks, you had switches for it, and you had to have interfaces for it, and tape decks to plug in, and all that sort. It was just a different time in computing, and, well, certainly one that will never come again, because everything's about immediacy nowadays from you know, ultra-fast DVD-ROM drives to ultra-fast <laughs> internet connections. No one likes to wait anymore. And 
to be fair, I don't like to wait either, but there was something about getting a game, getting home and knowing you're gonna have to sit there and wait for that damn thing to load for so long, and then you got to finally play. It just made it a little bit more special for me. And I really hope you enjoyed this, guys. Let me know if you do, and I'll, I'm more than willing to do a few more about of these for other systems. So like, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to. Don't forget, if you do subscribe, to ring that notification bell so you'll receive an update every time we release a new video. And uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing Tuesday yet, so comment and make up my mind for me, guys, okay? Take it easy, and I'll catch you later. He's spending 60% of his life locked in his fucking car shooting the same things over and over. Okay, that's a good point. We'll come on to this now. So, <laughs> in this game, we now have access to... I don't know if it was in the last game or not. Um, I didn't play that one, but the, the risk is much higher as well. Yeah, it's not just a PvP area either. Um, it's an area that allows PvP, but there are uh, AI enemies in there, and they're all hella tough. It's definitely designed for cooperative play in there. Yeah, and I'd actually suggest...